Well, good morning. And welcome to Seven Lakes Baptist Church. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, many of you may not know, many of you probably do know, that I struggle with Christmas messages. After 20 years of doing it, it feels like I'm doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Um, but I, I've been asking God, renew my Christmas spirit. Give me, some, give me something new <laughs> to, to teach. And... Uh, I, I want to have that anticipation. You know, when, we, when you're a kid and Christmas is coming and you like can't wait, your kids are up at 5 o'clock in the morning like, Dad, get up, Dad, get up. I want that kind of renewed excitement about Christmas, but not about Santa coming, but more about Jesus coming. And, uh, and so this morning, I wanna, we're going to look at some passages in the Old Testament that deal with people that had to wait for a long time to get their hope, to see the result of their hope. And, uh, and we're going to look at some in the Old Testament and some in the New Testament. And my prayer is that as we look at them, it will just spur a, a new um, excitement about Christmas, a new excitement about the things that we're waiting for, and, and give us hope. So it's called the hope of Christmas. But I want us to, um, one of the tragedies that we see with COVID out there is this hopelessness that, uh, you know, Christmas is a time where you get together with all your family and everybody, you know, you see loved ones that you haven't seen for a long time and everybody's telling you, don't go do that now. And don't go, you know, and there's dangers in that. And, and that's true. There are dangers in it. My family, my mom and dad both got COVID uh, over Thanksgiving. My brother and his family went up there and they got COVID and they didn't bring, none, neither of them brought it to each other. But some, my aunt came over to visit because she hadn't seen everybody and she didn't know she had it. So I had my whole family got COVID over the um, over Thanksgiving. So it's a real threat and a real scare, but, uh, but, but there's this hopelessness that we need to get past because so many of us struggle, especially now in this pandemic, of hopelessness. Um, yet we're told, uh, so the hopelessness continues. So this morning I want to take a look at some characters in the Bible who overcame hopeless situations and were full of hope uh, as they by faith believe God. So the first one I want us to look at is found in the book of Joshua. Joshua is one of my favorite books. Joshua chapter uh, 3 and verse 5. Joshua believed God's promise. He had faith in God's promise. But Joshua 3, 5, it says, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, and as I look in your perfect law of liberty, God, as we look at this book that is so full of hope, God, that hope is only found in you, Lord, and I pray that as we go through this message this morning and as we go through this Christmas this year, God, that we will walk around with hope that we can only have through you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll bless your word. I pray, pray that you'll take me, use me however you see fit. I pray, God, that you'll just, um, Lord, that when people leave here, they don't care about what I said, but they hear what you said. So, Lord, I pray that you'll bless this time. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Joshua, if you remember, Joshua and Caleb were two spies who, 40 years before this passage, had gone into the promised land. God had, they had come out of Egypt in the great exodus. They had come out, walked across on dry land, the, the Red Sea on dry land. God had parted the sea. They drank water from a rock. They had done all of these amazing things. God had provided for them in incredible ways. And now uh, Moses sends two, 12 spies into this promised land. And they come back and 10 of them said, we can't go. There's giants in the land. They'll kill us. We'll never make it. And so Joshua and Caleb say, wait a second, God just brought us across, we can, we can do this. And they went with the ten spies that didn't think they could make it, and what happened? They wandered for 40 more years. Now for 40 years, they had to walk around in this wilderness, and I have been there, it is a wilderness, there is nothing there. The Dead Sea's there. When we went, uh, when we went there uh, a few years ago, uh, the bus driver was telling us that one guy loved to fish. And so he said, well, we'll drop you off. We're going right past the Dead Sea. You can fish all day. Guy gets out of the thing, fishes all day. He didn't catch anything. It is the Dead Sea. There's nothing live in that thing. <laughs> but it was a time where... Um, it was a time where these people went in. They had to wander around the wilderness for 40 years in the wilderness waiting for every adult to die in that camp before they could go in, everyone except Joshua and Caleb. 
Now here they are, they're 40 years later, and they come getting ready to cross the river to go in and take this land that God has proclaimed. And so here they are at the brink, and can you imagine the excitement and the energy that, hey, we're about to go claim God's promise, what God had promised, we're about to go see exactly what he promised. And Moses, poor Moses, had to stand up, on a, stand up before this and look over. He could only see the promised land from a distance. He wasn't allowed to go in, and he had to die. But now they had wandered in this wilderness for 40 years, and today's the day that they're about to enter the promised land. I would imagine that the anticipation was so thick that you could cut it with a knife. The wonder of this land that God had promised to Abraham, a land flowing with milk and honey to Jacob, Israel, and now to the, uh, they are on the verge of seeing what God had promised. And I want to tell you where they were going to come in at. We stayed there, and it was it literally was a land flowing with milk and honey. Our hotel was in the middle of this, these orchards that were all around us, beautiful orchards everywhere. I always thought Israel was like this you know, desolate, deserty place. It was beautiful. There were, there were trees that were full of fruit everywhere. In fact, Israel was the number one exporter of flowers to Europe. I didn't know that. It's amazing. Uh, they're the number one diamond, diamond cutting place in the world too. So they have all kinds of neat things. But here's this group of people that God had called and separated, and they're about to go in there. And so I want you to look at this message that, uh, that Joshua says to him. First, he says, consecrate yourself. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourself. Consecrate means to set apart, that you're set apart for God's use, that I want to use you in a specific way, and so the only way I'm going to use you in a specific way is I'm going to set you apart for use that can only be used by God. And so what do they do? They go they are about to go into the water to cross over, and God says, I want to test their faith again. So he says, I want the priests that are carrying the altar. You remember the, or the Ark of the Covenant. So the priests that are carrying this Ark of the Covenant, they have to come up, and it's springtime, so the river is flowing. It's a pretty raging river. And the guys, there's, uh, I think there's eight guys that carry the, um, but there's, they're, they have to get all the way in the water. So the first guys get in, and, they're, and it's probably up to their waist by now, maybe up to their chest, and they're holding this, and the water's rushing down past them, and they're hanging on, going, what in the world? All Until all of them got in, and then the water stood up in a heap, and they walked across on dry land. And here they go. They're about to go into this city that they know that it's a fortified city. It's Jericho, and it's a fortified city, and they know this is the first time we're going to have to fight. How are we going to win this? But they walked across with faith, and then as soon as they got across, they carried rocks from the middle of that river, and they piled them up on the other side so they could come back and bring their children and their generations after them and show them that this is where we crossed, that this is where God parted the water for us to come into the promised land. Then they come, they go a little bit further, and God says, I want you to consecrate the men. I want to make sure that we are different than everybody else. Can you imagine, I just, I hate to even say this, but can you imagine men being circumcised before you go to battle? But that's exactly what God told them to do. But we know that they took down that city. They never lifted a sword. You know what they did? They walked around it once the one day. They walked around it seven times the last day, and they screamed and shouted and blew trumpets, and the walls came tumbling down. It's amazing what God did. But I want you to think about this man that had the hope that through this 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the 40 years of wondering, God, are we going to make it to this promised land? Because here we go again. We've walked that way before. Oh, we saw that before too. 40 years in this desert and in this desolate place. And now God's going to fulfill his promise. But I want you to understand that Joshua kept his hope. He put his faith in God's promise and he believed God's promise. Being separated is not easy. To stand apart in the world is difficult. But God specializes in difficult. They had to put themselves, the priests, they had to get in the river for the river to cross. They had to, they had to uh, circumcise themselves for God to, to completely do what he said he was going to do. All of these things they had to do were difficult things, but they believed God and they did what it said. And church, I'm afraid that in our world today, there's so few people who believe what God says to a point where they will forget everything else and say, God, I am following you completely. Because most of us, we hang on to something that we, that we ought to let go. And we're like, I'll give you all this other stuff, God, but, but I'm hanging on to this. And God says, I want it all gone. Because when you give it all up, then he can have full control. How awesome is that? 
that God allows us to struggle for a while, but he's going to give us full, or he will take full control. Maybe this Christmas you're feeling hopeless, like this pandemic will never end. I mean, we have kids that are committing suicide all over the world because they can't go to school. We have all, all kinds of mental health issues because people are separated and they have this anxiety. And God wants us to be together. As a Christian, we are called out ones, called to live a, a life separated to God. And maybe it's time to consecrate ourselves and say, God, I want to obey whatever it is you have for me. I mean, think about how, think about how much it would mean for somebody that's home, that, that's not able to get out, that's not able to come, uh, come to church, that's sitting at home, maybe watching the video, that can't do that. How much would it mean for them to get a call from you? How much would it mean if we said, you know what, I'm going to go out of my way and help this person or help these people because they have a need this Christmas? Because that's exactly what it's talking about is, is separating ourselves to God. Sometimes, we, uh, sometimes the hope for what God is going to do is like getting the cart before the horse. See, we want all the, the blessings. We want God to take us into the promised land and do all the abundant things that he says he will do. But we want him to do it before we consecrate ourselves. Before we say, God, I am going to live a life that's separated and consecrated to you. But when we live that life separated and consecrated to God, then he can accomplish what he wants to do. But he will do it in his time, not ours. The second person I want to look at this morning is, is Job. Look at Job chapter 3. 38 and verse 3. Now, let me just tell you a little bit of the story of Job. Job was a, uh, a pretty normal guy, but um, he, had, he believed God, he obeyed God, and Satan came to God and said, let me attack this guy. And in one day, the guy lost all of his children, all of his cattle, all of his, all of his homes, all of his wealth, everything he had was gone in one day. And then to put on top of that, these prosperity gospel preachers came. You know what a prosperity gospel is, right? That only good things are going to come from God, right? God's not going to, he's not going to allow anything bad to happen to you. And these prosperity guys came to him and they started saying, Hey, Job, what'd you do wrong? Job, you must have some sin in your life. Job, what's going on? How's this happening? And Job's like, it's not, I'm not in sin. What in the world? And then his wife's like, hey, Job, just turn your back on God and die so we can get out of this mess. I mean, just re relent, you know, quit believing God. And Job wouldn't do it. And he's going through this misery. And, and can you imagine having the weight of all of that on you in one day? Losing your whole life, losing your family, losing your uh, wealth, losing everything you have, knowing, not knowing where am I going to eat tomorrow? How am I going to make it through today? Well, Job's been attacked more than we could ever imagine. And all of his wealth was taken, and all of his livestock killed, and all of his children killed. Talk about a bad day. If anyone ever had the right to complain, to wallow in their misery, I would say that it would be Job. As if the destruction of Job endured wasn't enough, these prosperity guys come and start telling him what a, what a sinner he is. But notice what God says. He says, dress for action like a man. I, I love... That is one of my favorite verses. I just, I, this week when I was studying this, I was like, in the King James it says, now gird up your loins like a man. In other words, get up, put your pants on, let's get to work. Gird up your, gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and, I, and you will instruct me. In other words, Job, here I am, I'm God, stand up, get up, put your pants on, let's get after it. Now here we are, Job, now let me ask you some questions, Job. And he goes on for two chapters about this. It says, get up. To answer like a man, when I question you, you will inform me. Job, where were you when I established the earth? You complaining about something? Where were you when God established the earth? Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't existent. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who, fixes, who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. Who stretched a, me, a measuring line across it? What supports its foundation? How's the earth hang on nothing? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy, who enclosed the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds and its garment thick in darkness and in, uh, darkness it's blackened or blanket. Can, can you imagine standing before God Almighty and going, like, God, you're so cruel to me. God, I lost everything. God, I have nothing. And he says, okay, get up. Where were you when I created the earth? Do you know what my plans are? 
Do you know what I have in store for you? Job, you're, you're complaining about something that you have no control over. And you're, you're beating your head against the wall going, woe is me, woe is me. But God said, hey, I've got something greater for you. I've got something better. Notice what, get up, get to work. It, it, it's these questions that he asked. But sometimes life is hard. Life in a pandemic is hard. Experiencing holidays with a pandemic is hard. But not nearly as hard as Job had it. What did God tell Job? Get up, dress like a man, and know who I am. Do we know who God is? Do we know that God is bigger than all the problems I'm ever going to face in life? We worry about so many things that we could just give to God, that we could come to God and say, Lord, I don't understand this, but praise the Lord. You know what? One of the things we've been doing in uh, in the men's group that we're doing is we're learning how to pray, and you start your prayer with, just like he taught the disciples, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You start with praising God. How great you are, God. How great are you, Lord, that that you allowed me to live in America. How great are you, Lord, that you provided your son that gave the gospel to me, that lived and died, lived a perfect life and died on a cross for me, that paid the penalty for my sins. How awesome are you, God, that you you have given me children and my children have been blessed. And God, how awesome is it that I can leave out of church, that I can come here today and gather together and assemble with other people and then leave and go to a home that's going to be warm when I get there and I'm not going to have rain on my head. Do you know living in America, you are more wealthy? I don't care if you're the poorest person in America than 90% of the world how amazing is it that God how good is God to us and yet we can still find things to complain about I was reading something the other day that said that when uh, that the kids the more things that these that young people get uh, teenagers and stuff get the more they complain there you go parents you know what to get them for Christmas right (laughs) just saying I'm gonna get getting bad letters now But it's not about what we have. It's about who we have. And Job was faithful to the Lord regardless of what he had. The Apostle Paul said, I know how to live abased and I know how to, live, how to abound. I, I, whatever circumstances there are, I will praise the Lord. How awesome is that? But Job had the proper perspective. He had God's perspective. Look, there are people who are dealing with things that are way worse than us. We must remember that God loves us and he will use us for his glory. Do you know a surefire weapon against self-loathing loathing is serving someone else? Not getting paid for it, but serving someone else's need. Why do we go to the nursing home down here? Because that is an easy place for us to go and serve someone else. And see, you go down there and spend a little bit of time and see how little they have and how nobody brings them anything for Christmas and how they're just sitting there. It's miserable. But we are called to serve other people. We are called to love God and love people. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. i got to move quick here. Next one is going to be Hosea. Hosea chapter, uh, Hosea chapter 12 and verse 6. Here's Hosea. It is to love God at all costs. Hosea 12, 6. So you, by the help of your God, return. Hold fast to love and justice and wait continually for your God. I'm going to tell you a story about Hosea. Hosea was in love with this woman who was not a, let's say, an upstanding woman. She was a harlot. But Job, or um, Hosea fell in love with her and beg God to let him marry her. God said, okay, Hosea, marry her. So he marries her, and she goes and has children that aren't his children that he's taking care of. She winds up getting sold into slavery, um, and he goes and sells everything he has to go buy her back. And then she goes and does it again, and it's just this misery and this horrible life. And he's in love with this woman, and all she brought him was pain and misery. But just as Hosea wanted his wife to return home, God wanted Israel to repent and turn back to God. This is right before the Babylonian captivity. And Israel was whoring after all of these other gods, and they kept running away from God and serving these other gods and running over here and serving this God, and they wouldn't give God the time of day. And so they're getting ready to go into the Babylonian captivity. And and Hosea is called to prophesy and, and preach to them. 
And what Hosea could preach is that he loved this woman with everything he had, even though she left him, even though multiple times he had to get her out of trouble, multiple times she kept messing up. But you know what? In the end, she finally fell in love with him. But how many times is God chasing after us? And he wants so much for us, but we're running away and we're running away and we're running away and we're running after all these other things. But God says, I just want you to come here. I love you. And what's he say to Job? He says, return to God. Hosea was in love with this woman that was a prostitute. He, he eventually allowed, uh, allowed to marry her, but they were chasing after all of these things that weren't good for them. Israel was. But he says this, observe love and justice. Hosea had the right to divorce his wife. But God instructs him to hold on to love. Hold on to love. Just as God will never stop loving us, Hosea is told to hold on to love. To hold to justice. It means that we accept responsibility for our actions. See, the cost of sin is a great price. Not just for the sinner, but for everyone involved. And there are consequences for our sin, just like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of the unbelief. And Hosea paid a high cost as well, but he continued to love as God told him to. And then wait for God continually. You know what? I hate to wait. I am so impatient. I hate waiting. But God instructs Hosea to wait for God, knowing that the heartache must have been going, that he must have been going through when Gomer, his wife, the one that he loved, doesn't love, love you back. Now, when you're ready to quit, tells you, God tells you, wait for him continually. See, waiting for God is never easy and it's never fun. God uses the waiting sometimes in order to see if our faith is in him. Remember, Dr. Fall, well, used to say this all the time. He would say, uh, the measure of greatness of a man is not how many times you get knocked down, but how many times you get back up? You know, all of us have struggles in this life. All of us have sin in our life. All of us have things that, that knock us down. And it's really easy to go, oh, God, I'm done. I mean, how many times can I fail you, God, and still you love me? How many times, God, do I walk away from you and still you wait for me and still you love me? And God says, I want you to come back because I want to restore that relationship with you. I want to make it right again. And you're chasing after all these things that are just driving you away from me. And I want you to come back to me because I love you that much. How many times are we going to walk away? Will we wait for God continually? Hosea finally waited on God and he understood love and justice and he returned to God and his wife finally saw how much he loved her after he got her again. And they came back together again. I wish I could say, and they lived happily ever after. But they were about to go into Babylonian captivity. The next one, Luke chapter 1, verse 22. It says, and when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. This is Zechariah. Remember, after the Babylonian captivity, there were 400 silent years. 400 years where Israel didn't hear a peep from God. Nothing. For 400 years, they would go in the temple and they would, they would dress up and they would put their robes on, the ephod on, and they would have the bells on their bells on the bottom that would ring as they walked so they knew they were still alive. If the bell stopped ringing, they had a rope tied around their foot so they could pull them out of the Holy of Holies. And the priest would go in there, and this time it was Zachariah's turn. Zechariah is the high priest that gets to go in there, and it's, the Bible says that his whole family was outside praying for him. Now, can you imagine the anticipation? I am going in the Holy of Holies, and we know that people have died in there. That's why they tie the rope on our ankle so they can get us out of there so everybody that goes in doesn't die. But he has this anticipation of going in there, and he's old. He's an he's older man at the time, and his wife was old. Zechariah goes in there, and he's burning the incense, and all of a sudden, an angel appears to him, Gabriel. Gabriel Gabriel tells him that you're going to have a son. And he starts questioning Gabriel about 
come, don't you know how old I am? Don't you know all this stuff? But Zechariah hadn't heard, no one had heard from God in 400 years, and now Zechariah hears from him that his son, that he's going to have the son. This son's going to be named John. He, he, he's going to be, uh, he's going to be separated to God from birth. He's going to take the Nazarite vow from birth. And he was going to be uh, this upstanding man that is going, we, we know what he did. He went and preached and proclaimed and prepared the way of the Lord. Zechariah is in there and he's speechless. There's a song that I love that, uh, by Stephen Curtis Chapman that says, I am speechless, astonished and amazed. And I wonder about your amazing grace. I think if Zechariah had a voice, he'd have probably sang that song first. But Zechariah came in and he's just dumbfounded. He doesn't know what, his mouth won't open because he won't believe, because he won't believe this angel. He says, how do I know these things will happen? He said, well, I'm going to shut your mouth. You're not going to be able to talk until the baby's born. For nine months, the guy couldn't say a word. Some of you ladies are thinking, that's, a, that's pretty good. <laughs> but Zechariah heard from God. Can you imagine, you take your shoes off, you probably wonder, could I possibly hear from God today? Maybe you remember what Micah prayed. Micah prayed in Micah 7, 7. He said, but as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. And my God will hear me. And what an amazing honor for him to be able to go in and make the offering. And he probably went in there wondering, could I possibly hear from God today? And then he gets in there and Gabriel comes and gives him this great message. And he's speechless about it. His mind had been racing and, as he went in there, but now he comes out. And can you imagine looking at him when he comes out? And he goes, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. I saw God, or I saw the angel of the Lord. He spoke to me. God appeared to us, and he's given us this message, and I can't share it with you. I, I saw an angel. What? How do you say I saw an angel? How do you, how do, you do that? I don't know if they had, what's the game you play where you got to act out the things? Charades. I don't know if they had charades back then, but I'll bet you he was trying to figure out how to, say, how to tell them what he had heard and what he had seen. And not only that he'd seen this angel, but this angel, he promised them that they were going to have a child. And this child would be separated to God, and this child would live a holy life and a righteous life, and, and he would prepare the way of the Lord. And then you go later in the book of John, and you find John uh, that John um, baptized Jesus, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who's going to take away the sins of the world. He's preparing the way of the Lord. Whose shoes I'm not even, I'm not even righteous enough to loosen his sandals. Can you imagine the anticipation and the wait and the hope that was fulfilled in that time? The last one I want to look at today is Simeon. Luke chapter 2, just turn over one page. Luke chapter 2, verses 23 through 32. It says, just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer sacrifice, uh, sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered that temple complex when the parents brought in the child Jesus to per, uh, perform for him what was customary under the law. Simeon took him up in his arms and praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace according to your word. Verse 30, For my eyes have seen your salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. Jesus is brought to the temple. Mary and Joseph bring him there for this consecration to set him apart, kind of like we dedicate babies. And God had promised Simeon that he would see salvation, the person that salvation was coming in, the Messiah, before he died. I don't know how he knew it was the Messiah, but he knew. And he held that baby and he knew that this is the Messiah. Simeon had believed God's promise and every thought, or even though he was old, he believed God's promise and never lost hope. 
He says, my eyes have seen your salvation as he holds baby Jesus. This morning, I just want us to focus on Jesus this year. As he's the only one who brings hope to this world. So believe God's promise like Joshua did. Have the perspective that Job had. Even in the depths of his trouble, God reminded him that that God is sovereign and that he doesn't make any mistakes. Be speechless like Zacharias, astonished and amazed by God's wondrous grace. Have the faith. Have the faith of Simeon and be willing to wait on the Lord. Never lose hope. Church, as I went through this message, I I just, I was thinking how hopeless this world is without Christ. And we're seeing it everywhere. And we are called to go and share the good news that that the world isn't hopeless. We have hope and that hope is found only in Jesus Christ. And only when we surrender to his will and only when we uh, submit to him will we see that hope. So here's the invitation this morning. The invitation is to come and partake in communion. What do we do when we take communion? We are we are looking back, looking back at what Christ did, remembering what he did done on the cross. As we eat the wafer, it's a reminder of his body that was given for us. As we partake of the cup, it's a reminder of the blood that was shed for us. It's a reminder. It's looking back at what he had done. But it's also looking in. The Bible tells us that we're supposed to take communion uh, with uh, with a clear conscience that that means we've confessed our uh, confessed our sin to God that we are right before him and, and that we're right with other people and if there's somebody that you need to get right with you should get right with them before you take communion and then we look forward because we have a lot to look forward to we just finished the eschatology in our doctrine series and we know that we have we can look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ the coming of our Messiah he's coming again and it could be today It could be tomorrow. It could be in 100 years. But I want to be ready when he comes back. And so as we finish this service, I just want us to have this hope of Christmas, this hope that uh, that only comes through Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you today is that as we have this invitation, we're going to what we're going to do is we're going to pray. I'm going to go down here. I'm going to pray. I'm going to go down here. And I want you to search your heart and say, God, am I right before you? And if I'm right before you, when you're ready, I want you to come up and take communion and go back to your seat and wait. And it's these plastic things. I had a hard time getting them open this morning. But in the top is a wafer. And you peel the top layer off and you can have the wafer. And then uh, you peel the second layer off and it'll be the juice. But I know it's not how we normally do communion. But in COVID, that's where we're at today. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And then when you're ready, you can come up and take communion. Just go back and sit in your seat and we'll partake together. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much that you loved us. God, I thank you so much that, uh, that you've given us hope this Christmas, Lord, even in a pandemic, Lord, that we have heart, our hope is in you. Lord, our hope isn't in a vaccine. Our hope isn't in a president and it isn't in a political party. Our hope is found only in you. And just as we've seen with, uh, Lord, with uh, these characters that we've looked at in the Bible, Lord, that even when things seemed hopeless, Lord, they had hope because their hope was in you. Lord, I pray that as we, uh, as we partake in communion this morning, Lord, that you'll help us to look inward and see, Lord am, I, uh, Lord, am I complaining about things that I ought not to be complaining about? Am I serving others in love? Lord, am I living a life that, that's how you called me to live? And God, I pray that as we uh, observe this this morning, Lord, that you'll help us to make sure that we're right before you. So God, I pray that you'll um, bless this time now. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.